In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades, and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt, where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria, with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books, but what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show but behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country, and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. 
For example, she was once in conflict with her brother, Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman Emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the Emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman Emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years and it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Muvul Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. So not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. 
In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. 
The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony, and this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold reaching temperatures as low as minus five degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. A recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. 
Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music, just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, Hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So, why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called micro -seisms. It's like the Earth's own heartbeat, felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still. It's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, Languages spoken in high-altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages, or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So, the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. 
You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. The Earth has three main layers. Two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. And then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above 
compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles. They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah, turns out it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. 
Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. Now let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow. Mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice, but these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. 
Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. Several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry, observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes. And even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future. But right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity. And they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence?